and you are good to go. <laughs> well, good evening to all of you and anyone who might watch this in a, in a future time that will uh, look up this recording. I guess uh, I began the year in January with a presentation basically on reflection on God's time, you know, versus the time that we're all familiar with, hours and weeks and months. And so when this opportunity came up for me being in May, May is traditionally a Marian month with October. And so I thought that I would have a, the theme of Mary, kind of a combination of a personal reflection or personal experience, as well as some uh, church teachings regarding Mary, the Blessed Mother, and also feast days, kind of the liturgical year of the church. And uh, I think for most all of you, it will be a lot of review. But for me, uh, I've been a priest for about 26 years. I'm always learning new things or relearning things uh, about, about the church and church teaching. So that's um, a brief outline of that. First, I'll just begin with a personal reflection. I grew up in Salisbury, very close to here. And in our county, there's about 300 churches, Rowan County. And there's one Catholic parish, where the whole county is uh, the territory of that parish. And so, and we were a pretty small parish as well. So most of the people that I knew in school or in sports or in um, work, uh, we're not Catholic, you know, we were, we were small in number. So I can remember getting questions often about teachings of the church. Now, again, the other thing about this is this was in the seventies and the church had gone through a great um, transition and was still trying to kind of find uh, uh, some footing and structure following uh, the Second Vatican Council. So I didn't really have a very good, not faulting them. I don't think our catechetical program was really all that good. And uh, again, the people were trying and all that, but there were a lot of people, me included, who just didn't have a very good formation. So when a Baptist person, for example, many of the people I knew were Baptist uh, or just kind of a general Bible-based congregation would ask me a question about Mary or the Pope or, you know, uh, uh, the kind of the typical questions. I wasn't really all that comfortable with answering those questions because I wasn't really all that uh, knowledgeable of my own faith. And the, even the catechisms in those days, at least that were available to us, were not really that... Um, detailed. Uh, I mean, they were more like encyclopedias and it, it wasn't, uh, especially when you're growing up, say 14, 15 years old, uh, the catechisms were not that um, user-friendly, so to speak. They were very formal. So that's kind of my background as far as my knowledge, but I did remember, I do remember getting a lot of questions about Mary and in the, the context of those questions, there were things such as the brothers and sisters of Jesus, which you'll find in scripture, but I was not a scripture scholar. I didn't realize that there was no other term, for example, kinfolk, you know, uh, cousins or, uh, you know, even as the apostle Paul says, brothers, you know, he wasn't talking about his own family, you know, brothers in Christ. So there's different uses of the word. Uh, so that's as a background. And then to add to that, as I grew up, you know, and got it traveled and things like that, I would hear people say, well, there's too much emphasis on Mary. Again, these are people usually what we'd say the separated churches were union with them and our belief in Christ, but we have our 
our differences as well. They would say there's too too much emphasis, you know, to have a shrine to Mary. That's not right. And um, I can't even remember the first time I saw a parish. This was long before I was ever a seminarian or anything. Mary, Queen of the Universe. And it just, it caused me to pause a little bit. I just wasn't, I didn't really understand things like the, uh, you know, the, the mystery of the rosary that proclaims that. Or I just, I wasn't, I just wasn't that sharp on things like that. And I even thought, my goodness, well, this, this, uh, this people driving by this parish, uh, they're certainly going to be critical, you know, Baptists and, and others would say, my goodness, Mary, queen of the universe. Well, the Lord is the king of the universe. So, the, so I'm just saying is that, that I wasn't really comfortable with a lot of things like that. So that's going back now. In 1985, I was 24 at the time working after college. And I went to a Lenten mission. And it, it, as I said, in, I had it in the bulletin before. That mission basically changed my whole life and uh, kind of rediscovered my faith. I kind of joke that I had been confirmed at the age of 12, 12 years earlier. And it basically, it took 12 years for it to kind of like, it was a delayed uh, effect. So at the age of 24, I, I kind of rediscovered my faith. And one of the things emphasizing that mission was a rosary. And I had had a rosary probably since my confirmation. It was in a drawer and it was broken and a couple, couple links had broken, but I didn't really know, understand it. I didn't understand the mysteries. I was really a, a ignorant, you might say. So I started out and my concentration was pretty bad as well. I started out with one Our Father, one Hail Mary, and one Glory Be. And that's how bad my concentration was. And kind of worked my way up to a decade. And I picked up, I was in a parish where there were um, a lot like a book rack, you know. And so I picked up, you can see there's something like this. It's just like a little brochure pray the rosary daily. And so that was kind of like, a, you know, this is long before the internet or uh, tapes or videos or anything like that. So it was, it was what you could get your hands on and actually read. Um, I remember I was up in Washington visiting my grandmother once and we went into, um, I think it was a Franciscan monastery, it was another shrine. And I, I bought a rosary and it was so funny because this is when they were putting the um, the warnings on uh, packs of cigarettes and uh, bottles of liquor and all this, like warning, this product might cause uh, bad health, you know, something like that. Well, I bought a rosary and they were kind of making a play on words with that warning, like a disclaimer, you know, warning, the use of this rosary may cause you to grow in your spiritual life, you know, and it had all of these things that were, that were good things, but it was like a, like a disclaimer, like your faith will grow if you use this product here. And so uh, that I got a kick out of that. So then I got uh, better and, and I used to, used to hate to wait in line at a grocery store or wherever, DMV waiting in line. And so then I'd, I'd carry a rosary with me. And uh, while I'm waiting in line, I'd say, well, might as well put this time to good use. And uh, so that's, that really helped. And then learning more of the, uh, I bought a little bitty question and answer catechism at the parish and started just reading the basic questions. And, and all that was, was helping me uh, to grow. So, after, you know, I heard the call of the Lord, it was a discernment of about three years more of work before I, uh, before I retired, you know, from the working force and uh, embraced the simple life. So 
in the seminary, and I was seven year process for me from the time I quit work to the time I was ordained, uh, you know, and, and learning things uh, every year, learning more about the church and ministry. And um, there were a lot of groups in the seminary, prayer groups and study groups and things like that. And um, there was a group that prayed the rosary at 9 p.m. in our little chapel. And um, one of the guys I knew who was from the, the Diocese of Brooklyn, and not to be stereotypical, my grandmother was born in Brooklyn, but he fit the part. You know, he talked fast, he walked fast, he uh, was always in a rush. And uh, he told me one time in the hallway, he said, why don't you come pray the rosary with us at 9 p.m.? And I said, well, you know, I usually pray the rosary when I drive, you know, when, in this little seminary in St. Mindred, about anywhere to go, like you had to go to the store, a restaurant or whatever, it was always about a 30 minute drive, it was a real rural area. So that's when it was perfect time, I'd go somewhere, pray the rosary on the way. And uh, so I said, I pray the rosary when I drive. He said, but do you drive every day? And I said, no, sometimes I don't drive, but you know, maybe once a week or so, you know, didn't have to go that many places. And so he was kind of just a, a little pushy about it, but that's <laughs> Brooklyn, you know? So I started joining them. And, and I mean, that was kind of a great invitation uh, to me to make it more of a, uh, of a daily uh, routine. And then after I was ordained, you know, the, that, that type of thing continued. And then after I'd been ordained for a few years, Pope John Paul II added the mysteries of light and came out with a letter on uh, the rosary, apostolic letter. And in here, the Pope encouraged in that letter, I think it was around uh, 2000 or 2001 or so, he encouraged a daily rosary and even told about how he had started before he was a seminarian uh, with his father and his father died of a daily rosary. So that really was the beginning of when I made a commitment to a daily rosary. And, uh, and I can say that in these last, you know, 18 years or thereabouts, that there actually have been few days that I have not, uh, only a few days that I have not prayed the rosary. I usually try to do it early in the morning and um, because sometimes the evening uh, is very, very tiring uh, with all of the events and calls and uh, messages and everything during the day. So that's been um, part of my uh, experience. And then it varies too, depending on where I am. Usually I do a, a nice uh, road bike ride on uh, Mondays. And so I have a little um, a Bluetooth so I pray the rosary and the chaplet, riding a bicycle, sometimes walking, hiking, you know, sometimes just in the church or the chapel, or uh, uh, sometimes just sitting in a chair. Uh, so, but it is a commitment that I made uh, early in this uh, millennium to, um, to pray the rosary every day. So, and I am a believer that, uh, the meditation of the rosary is a peaceful prayer. And also we can include our own petitions in the rosary. Uh, you know, I visited a, a family years ago, a Hispanic family, and it was after dinner, six children, and they weren't doing it just because I was there, because they were, they were experienced. They did it every day. Right after dinner, all six children and the parents got on their knees in the living room and prayed the rosary. And I joined them and it was really a touching uh, experience for me because we had, I, I had never remembered having a, a rosary, a family rosary. And so that was a great witness uh, for me. You know, I had my one grandmother that she was the kind of person, even in her nineties, she lived to be 96, where her rosary was never, basically never out of her hand even if she was riding a bus or, or, or 
train or something, the rosary was like, like an extension of her hand or it wasn't in her hand. It was, she could get to it very quickly out of her, out of her purse. And um, I often think about that when uh, at a funeral home, when we have uh, someone who has a rosary in the hand in, uh, you know, somebody, especially like my grandmother who had that devotion, basically her whole, whole life. And uh, so anyway, but we just didn't have that in my own immediate family. Uh, like I said, my rosary had been in a drawer broken for years. And um, I have so many rosaries now with the RCIA. I always, because people go to Rome or go places and uh, go to a shrine or even these uh, sisters that were here last month or so, give me a rosary. So I always have many rosaries, some of them I bought, uh, but many are were gifts of people who are on a pilgrimage or travels or, you know, you know, they go somewhere and think, oh, we'll, we'll get something for father, you know, so that's, uh, that's nice. But I am <laughs> very willing to um, let them, let them go. Like I said, I think there was a time when I had one broken rosary and now I have um, many rosaries, you know, and I, offer them to people or somebody sometimes will catch me after mass do we have any rosaries here and i say i'll i'll get you one i'll get you one that i have uh, in the general context of mary the blessed mother there are some church teachings and we have in the rcia sometimes these are are common questions uh, of people who have heard things or seen things on television or known Catholics and you know had some ideas. And so I think that's a good thing. We begin the RCIA process with questions and answers for people to have um, you know to have you know some some clarity on some of these issues. And as I mentioned, one of the ones that often comes up, uh, the other uh, siblings of Jesus. And scholars would say that the same word for kinfolk or cousins is the same as brothers and sisters. Now, of course, you know, I, again, nothing against them, but if you're going to try to tell a Baptist that, they're not going to, most of them are not going to, not going to believe you. But Anybody with some, some scholarship or a Bible with footnotes and things like that will know that's the case. Now, the Catholic Church teaches, so it's not open for debate, that these kinfolk are not children of Mary. So again, that's just, that's church teaching. They're not, they're not uh, children of Mary. I think that when people, again, nothing against their intention or their uh, integrity or anything like that. But if people think that Mary had all these other children, it does make her life uh, a little less set apart, so to speak. From, from our perspective, Mary was chosen from all women of all time to be the mother of our Savior and Redeemer. And so in a sense, she's very special. Now, I don't think any of these people would say that the Lord was not special, but they're saying, well, if he had all these brothers and sisters running around, Mary wasn't all that special. That's where we, we have a different, a different view of this. Uh, again, growing up in Rowan County, for such feast as the Assumption of Mary, celebrated August 15th, out of 300 churches in the county, we'd be the only one celebrating the Assumption of Mary. Our national Feast day, December 8th, the Immaculate Conception of Mary. Uh, a very joyful day uh, throughout the church. Uh, again, the, the, another big one, certainly grown in these last, uh, since the years that I've been a priest, Our Lady of Guadalupe, December the 12th. And um, I'll just go ahead and say that I have been to some of the great places of Marian devotion and history and pilgrimages, very fortunate uh, that I've been, that I've 
that I have actually traveled to some of these places. Before the pandemic, a few months before that, I was in Fatima. We have Our Lady of Fatima will be celebrated on Thursday this week. And 1917, over 100 years ago, the three little children, shepherd children, that had this uh, apparition and messages from Mary and the, the one who lived, the two, two of them died fairly young. Uh, the other one lived in her 90s. Uh, she had messages after that as well from Mary. Uh, two of the three visionaries are now canonized saints. So that puts, you know, some credence to, uh, to the devotion. Now, again, something like Our Lady of Fatima, although it's a memorial in the church, the actual messages are considered kind of private revelations. So they're not part of the catechism. They're not part of the, um, the teachings, official teachings of the church, but they are, the church has said there's nothing opposed to the teaching of the church in the message of Our Lady of Fatima. And I was very fortunate I'd heard about it. I'd been invited over many years. And finally, this trip uh, worked out um, about a year and a half ago or so. So that was a great trip. I'd been to Lourdes once before as a seminarian, but I went there, you know, it's in a, a mountainous area. And I went there in the winter and it was very cold and uh, there was hardly anybody there. Most of the uh, stores and restaurants and everything were closed in the winter and uh so anyway but i had a very peaceful trip i took the train from uh, from belgium over there to lords and i just spent basically a day there this last one we spent several days in lords and it was um it was very fulfilling to be part of the the candlelight procession in the evening the rosary with you know all the pilgrims from all over rosary Every decade was in a different language and, you know, kind of gives you a sense of the uh, universal nature of the church uh, to, to celebrate the mass at the grotto. Uh, there was another priest with me and we basically took turns every day as far as who would be the presider and who would be the concelebrant. And um, I was just very fortunate that uh, and there were other few, couple other priests there who joined us, but uh, I was fortunate that I was the presider at the grotto in Lourdes. And again, it's a very spiritual place of pilgrimage. There have been miracles in Lourdes. There are people that have um, healings, both physical and spiritual healings. And, um, and again, the one who had the vision is a saint in heaven, Saint Bernadette. So again, when a, when a saint is involved, it has some credence to it. Well, I was very fortunate uh, to be there. Uh, I was once in, um, in Notre Dame in, um, in Paris years ago. I was, we were there in Paris the last time, but we could just see it through the fence because it was, it was after the fire and, and all of that. But I did go in there uh, 20 years or so earlier as a seminarian and um, the thing that so impressed me about it was you can actually hurt your neck looking up. It was so high in there. I remember thinking to myself, my goodness, you could about put the shuttle inside this church. It was so, it was so high. Anyway, that Gothic uh, architecture. And then we've all learned more about the history of it with this um, recovery and the uh, I just saw a, a short thing on YouTube the other day about the progress that's being made uh, on the arches and, and all the, the water damage and the heat damage and, and all of that. But there is a commitment to, um, to rebuild and to, um, to do it right. So that's good news. But I, I'll just show you how ignorant I was when I was growing up and I would hear about college football Notre Dame is playing, you know, for a championship or playing a big rival or something like that. I did not know. For one thing, I didn't know where that school was. I didn't know what the translation was. Uh, I had no, I didn't have a clue. 
now I know it means Our Lady. But when I was in high school or college, I didn't have a clue of what Notre Dame stood for. You know, it just shows you where my um, my formation and all was just totally lacking. I didn't even know it was a Catholic school. And uh, years later, I saw something, you know, you see a word and you think, well, this word means this. And, and uh, oh, all these years later, I found out Notre Dame means Our Lady. So, um, so anyway, I've been to Notre Dame in Paris. I've been uh, fortunate that also in Paris, we went to the, it's like a shrine, Our Lady of, of the miraculous metal and uh that was a again I, I knew about it but i learned about the mirac the history of the miraculous metal saint catherine uh Labore. and it was a uh, it's a great story and we had mass there in the little chapel uh i've been to knock ireland and uh again that was just a name for me before we went on this irish tour uh, I didn't really know much about it, um, but it is a major pilgrimage site in Ireland. Uh, just share you a little experience that I, that I had there. It's like um, Lourdes and, and others, where there's masses every hour. You know, one finishes and another one starts. And you might say that I made a, a grand entrance in uh, Our Lady of Knock. We got there right as the mass was starting. We had called in, they knew a priest was, so I wasn't the principal celebrant. There were several other priests that were already there. And um, I've had this experience before. When you're going in through a closed door, but you don't really know where you're going. You know, you don't know what's on the other side of that door. There's no glass or anything. So we got there. And this, we get into this, the sacristy, which was in the back. And they said, here, you know, get, get an alb on, get a stole on. And the mass had already begun. So it's kind of hurrying. And so um, I think it was there like during the first reading. They said, go through that door. So I went through the door and the bells, you know, for the altar server were on the floor right there. So here I'm trying to sneak in and trying to slip in and I kicked those bells on the way in and everybody turned like, who's this, uh, who's this American coming in through the back door? Mass has already started and he kicked the bells on the way in. So, And so another one, I've been to Our Lady of Guadalupe many times and uh, just, just on the edge of Mexico City. And that I believe is the largest by attendance um, Marian shrine in the world. You know, before COVID, the number was about 20 million pilgrims a year. And, and again, that's a uh, tremendous site there. Years ago, when I used to go up to the Smoky Mountains and go backpacking, our little parish in uh, Cherokee is Our Lady of Guadalupe. And I used to stop in there sometimes uh, on my way to the Smoky Mountain uh, Park. But I didn't really know what uh, the tradition was or what the, what the history was. And so now I've, I've been to uh, the original Our, Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico uh, many times. And again, that's a great experience for me. So that's, a, again, kind of a personal, I've been to some great shrines. And then of course, even just uh, parishes and small shrines of Our Lady uh, that are very touching. And again, the, the Feast of the Church. There are many Marian feasts in the course of the year. Uh, and again, Mary, St. Louis de Montfort, we just had his memorial a couple weeks ago. He wrote True Devotion to Mary several hundred years ago and that book that book is probably one of the best sellers of all time you know when you when you have a book that say 300 years after it was written is still in print 
and people are still reading it uh, is quite quite an accomplishment. Uh, I think up with um, uh, the life of Christ and um, of course the Bible, but I mean books that people have written. A True Devotion to Mary by St. Louis de Montfort is up there pretty pretty high. Uh, again, one of the points he makes is, is Mary is not a goddess, but it's through Mary to her son, through Mary to Jesus. And again, one of the great images that we have in scripture is at the wedding feast of Cana, how the host and you know the mary they or they they came to mary to ask for the miracle for the multiplication or the providing the wine that was running low and um so that's in a certain sense of intercessory prayer you know to bring the request to mary and she'll bring it to her son and initially jesus was not not going to do he says my hour has not yet come and she just said to the servants do whatever he tells you and again that's a a, a great message that mary was said don't do what i tell you do whatever he tells you and they filled him up with water which became the fine wine of cana so there's a great scriptural image there for intercessory prayer uh, a few other of the feasts the year begins January 1st with the solemnity of Mary, the mother of God. And that is the feast for the Diocese of Charlotte. That is our Mary under that title is our patroness for the Diocese of Charlotte. It begins the year. I've always been a little bit surprised that it's not a bigger attendance because most people are off on January 1st. Maybe some people stayed out a little too late on the, the 31st, you know, but the mass is never that well attended. And it is a holy day of obligation and also a um, uh, solemnity. Great way to begin the year. We have the presentation of the Lord on February 2nd. You know, the, the Lord was presented in the temple. Uh, the Annunciation when Mary received the uh, message of the Archangel Gabriel is March 25th, which, you know, again, it wasn't until I was in the seminary that I recognized that that's nine months before Christmas. So again, you're talking about a, a nine month cycle there from March 25th to December 25th. The, what we'll have coming up this week, Our Lady of, of Fatima, on the 13th, that was the date of the first vision in, uh, in Fatima, Portugal. And in a couple of weeks, the 31st, the visitation of Mary visiting her kinswoman, Elizabeth, as we recognize as the second joyful mystery. The a couple of them that are movable with the date of Easter and everything, the Monday after Pentecost is Mary, the mother of the church. And that's a that's one of the newer ones that uh, since Pope Francis has been in office, Mary, the mother of the church. And then nine days after Corpus Christi, the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So then, as I mentioned, uh, the Assumption of Mary on the 15th. Now, the Assumption of Mary is a dogma, a dogma of the church. So just for example, I hope it doesn't have to come to this, but if, if we had somebody in the RCIA said, okay, I believe what's in the creed. You know, I believe this and that, but I don't believe that, that Mary was assumed into heaven. Well, that's official teaching of the church. If you don't believe that, you can't be confirmed. So again, uh, hopefully they won't ever. And, I, and what I, my thing would be, let me help you to try to come to, to see this, um, this teaching, come to, come to grips with it. Uh, the birth of Mary is celebrated on September the 8th. I remember I had a parishioner once up in Sparta and she said, um, Mary wasn't born on September the 8th. And I said, well, that's when we celebrate her nativity. There are three birthdays 
in the church, the Lord, Mary, and John the Baptist. She said, no, some visionary somewhere or another said it was really another day. I said, well, perhaps that visionary should convince the Pope because the Pope is in charge of the liturgical calendar. But until that time, we're celebrating the Nativity of Mary on September the 8th, because that's what the liturgy says. So it hasn't been, that was about 10 years or 20 years ago. It hadn't been changed yet. Uh, September the 15th, the following week, Our Lady of Sorrows, which is very close to the memorial of the, really the feast of the exaltation of the cross. And Our Lady of Sorrows is a, a reflection of Mary at the foot of the cross, really, which was foretold by Simeon that a sword would pierce her own heart. So again, that's the, the background of Our Lady of Sorrows. And I think that it's a great image for those who are grieving to turn to Mary as one who was certainly in great sorrow at the foot of the cross. Our Lady of the Rosary, October the 7th. And this is a feast that goes back hundreds of years. Again, people would pray the rosary in time of trial. And this was when there was a big invasion in Europe and it was a big catastrophe and they prayed uh, for the Christians. And so that is the, the, the background of the feast of Our Lady of the Rosary. And uh, as I mentioned, our national feast day, that the bishops of each country basically set a uh, feast day or a patron saint for the nation. Like in Spain, it's St. James. Uh, in Italy, St. Joseph. Uh, Turkey, St. Nicholas, where he was from. In our country, December the 8th is our national feast day, Mary under the title, the Immaculate Conception. And then of course, in Mexico, just four days later, Our Lady of Guadalupe, December the 12th, which is also becoming a very big feast in the United States, certainly with all of the heritage that we have from, um, from Mexico and really from Latin America as well. Uh, we have, and even in our parish, we have um, big crowds often Our Lady of Guadalupe this last year with COVID, everything was uh, cut back. But nationally, it, it can be very big in some places. In, in Charlotte, uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe Parish, they would rent out one of the um, like arenas, like Cricket Arena or something like that. And they might have several thousand people for the mass on Our Lady of Guadalupe. They'd even bring in maybe a bishop from Mexico or things like that, which is really shows how, how big uh, that feast is just in a place like Charlotte and other parts you go to somewhere like Texas or California that would be even even bigger in some way. even in even in Manhattan there's a huge celebration for Our Lady of Guadalupe so those are some of the backgrounds I have there's um Marian art I have been to the Vatican a couple times and the Pieta is probably one of the best known sculptures in the world. I even have a little copy of it in my office, you know, just a little small copy. But I've seen the, the original one and Michelangelo, it's a masterpiece and he did it. He was only about 20 years old or so when he did the Pieta. I think it's the only work I've already ever signed. And the story about that was, is when St. Peter's wasn't even finished yet, still under construction. He was over there just seeing what people would say about it. It was at night, I think, kindled it. And somebody walked by and said, yeah, I think so-and-so did that. It was somebody else. So he came back after everybody had left and chiseled his name in it, uh, Michelangelo. He didn't, want it to, he didn't want somebody else to get credit for it. Uh, but it's certainly 
a great depiction. And I remember hearing one time someone talking about the Pieta and said, it's not a work of art so much. It is. We says not so much a work of art, but it's an act of faith. You know, you can't do something at that level without believing, believing that this is our Lord and this is a blessed mother, you know, image there. Of course, Mary and child is a great image in art. We had a uh, person who died last year, right when the COVID started. And they had a big painting of Mary and child that's now over in the rectory. And um, it, it's, it's very nice, it's very beautiful. And um, I think when I leave or the Lord calls me from this life or whatever, I'll probably donate it to our to our college seminary, uh, but for the time being, it's got a very good place over in uh, the rectory. There are many works of art uh, in that. Even even in our parish church, we have uh, statues of Our Lady, basically a traditional image like Our Lady of Grace, and then also Our Lady of Guadalupe in the uh, in the narthex, and those are are very well well done as well. Uh, a couple of other things, certainly the, the Hail Mary, which is kind of a combination of the words of Elizabeth at the time of the visitation and, uh, and also from the Archange Archangel Gabriel. Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. And so again, it's kind of a, a meditative prayer uh, to Mary. Uh, there are, in church teaching and reflections, there are the sorrows of Mary and the joys of Mary. And again, those are, um, those are great for devotions and um, you know, for, for our personal uh, prayer and study. The, um, the joys, for example, the joys of Mary, like finding the Lord in a temple and, uh, you know, the, the, the joy, the joy of the Lord, the Annunciation, and of course the sorrows, Mary at the foot of the cross, the way of the cross, even their, you know, their meeting uh, along the way, uh, the Magnificat that those of us in the clergy and many religious and even many lay people will pray the Magnificat every evening as part of our evening prayer or Vespers. You know, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. So Mary is proclaiming the greatness of the Lord and also that every generation will call me blessed uh, for her faithfulness uh, from being chosen from all women. And um, again, I'm convinced that our spiritual lives will benefit, will be enriched by devotion to Mary. Again, if it doesn't take away from our love of the Lord, as some people might, uh, might think, but it adds to it. It's like the, the family. Um, this is a year dedicated to St. Joseph as well. And I'm very pleased to see that, that there's a great love and, um, and looking to St. Joseph as well. Uh, and he's got no quotes in scripture, and yet he's held up as an honorable, a just man, a defender, a protector of the Holy Family, and a man of work as well. So again, it's uh, the Holy Family, very important to us, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. So those were a few notes, a few reflections that I have. Again, I can relate to people who uh, aren't quite there yet, because again, I wasn't, I didn't even know what Notre Dame meant, you know, and uh, I couldn't, uh, didn't, didn't have the concentration to pray a rosary uh, when I was rediscovering my faith. So again, I can, I can relate to people that are still on that journey, uh, but I can say that it is, it's great to have a spiritual life uh, and be dedicated uh, to prayer. And certainly a, a family rosary 
again, we never had it in our family, but I admire that. Um, and, and again, praying the rosary in, uh, in many, many different contexts, praying with children, uh, praying for a special cause at a time of war, a respect for life, uh, somebody going into a transition, remember them in the rosary. We've had several deaths just in the last week or so, and often the rosary is part of the funeral rites, or at least with the family. Uh, traditionally, there's a lot of that. So uh, I think it's, uh, it's great. So this particular month, as I mentioned, with October are, are dedicated as Marian months. We have two, well, really even Mother's Day, as Mary is a blessed mother, we, we can't forget that. And then also this month, Our Lady of Fatima, and then also uh, Mary, the, uh, the 31st is the, the visitation of Mary to her kinswoman, Elizabeth. So any um, questions or comments, any uh, rebuttal or any kind of uh, <laughs> ideas?